This is Scott Ritchie, and this is compressed gas volume or compressible gas volume. I will be discussing what is compressed gas volume, how is it useful, and how do we use it clinically. Now, I cannot talk about compressed volume without talking about two other things. And one of the things I'll be talking about is I will be talking about the patient circuit compliance, and I'm just going to put CPC for short. And then one other thing is the tubing compliance factor. Now, what is compressible gas volume? Uh, when we set a tidal volume on a mechanical ventilator, it's not necessarily the volume going to the patient or that the patient receives. So this depends on the type of ventilator and how old the ventilator is. And you might notice the differences between transport ventilators or an anesthesia machine ventilator. Uh, some of these ventilators do not compensate for uh, the compressed gas volume. So what happens is during a positive pressure breath, so I'm going to just um, draw a positive pressure breath going to the patient. Energy is also lost in the circuit. So this energy is lost in the circuit because the um, circuit expands. And this depends on how stiff the circuit is or how compliant the circuit is. And depending on how compliant the circuit is determines how much actually volume is lost in this circuit. And this volume does not go to the patient at all. You may notice this if you have done neonatal ICU rotations or work in a center that uses um, high frequency jet ventilation. And you notice that patient ventilator circuit is very stiff. It's a very rigid system. So very little, it doesn't stretch much at all. And very little energy is lost. So this energy um, goes to the patient. Now, why is this is important? I already kind of um, hinted on it or went over it. And this is particular for volume control ventilation. You're kind of only worried about gas volume, uh, the compressible gas volume when you're using volume control modes or volume target, not volume targeted modes, but volume control modes, specifically volume control. Because my set title volume is going to be different than what actually the patient receives. So my set might be 500 cc's, but my patient might, might be only getting 450 cc's. Now this is not significant in an adult patient population. However, this could be big in pediatric patients. These minute changes in tidal volume delivery. So on older ventilators, how do we calculate um, the patient circuit compliance? So we know how much tidal volume is lost when we do um, deliver breath to a patient with each breath. Now, I haven't done this procedure for over 15 years. I'm used to ventilators that automatically do it. But how the ventilator does it is you will have to include the circuit and my um, patient circuit, the compliance of my patient circuit is equal to the delivered tidal volume divided by my peak inspiratory pressure minus my peak value. So say that the machine, we had a set tidal volume of 500. 
However, it only delivered 300 milliliters, and this created from occlusion a high peak inspiratory pressure of 150 cc's, and we weren't using PEEP at all. This would give me a patient circuit compliance of 2 milliliters per centimeter of water. And this is also known as the tubing compliance factor because we put this value back into equations to figure out how much volumes actually lost during breath delivery. Now from this picture, this is an example of a system checkout. And if we look down here during the leak test, it also checked for my circuit compliance. So the circuit was occluded and it figured out my circuit compliance there. And as you notice, it's highlighted my circuit compliance is 1.15 milliliters per centimeter water. And this is a very stiff circuit that is being used here. A normal circuit compliance is anywhere from two to three milliliters per centimeter of water. And what this means is basically we can think of this for every centimeter of water above your set PEEP, you're going to lose two to three milliliters of tidal volume. Or in this case, based on the circuit compliance, you're going to lose 1.15 milliliters. So how do we find out the tidal volume loss? So here's the equation. To find the tidal volume loss, it equals the peak inspiratory pressure minus the peak times the tubing compliance factor. So let's figure it out. So the example I'm going to use is my peak inspiratory pressure was 40, which has delivering this breath to the patient. And I had a peak set of 5. And my tidal volume, I mean, sorry, my tubing compliance factor is 1.15. So that would be, well, this was supposed to be 45, sorry. I'm going to erase this. This was supposed to be 45. So 40 times my 1.15, my tubing compliance factor, equals 46 milliliters. So this is the tidal volume loss with every breath. And then, like I said before, um, in adult patients, it might not be significant. But we have to also look at the um, minute ventilation itself. So say I had a set rate of 10 breaths per minute or a frequency of 10 breaths per minute. If I multiply that by my tidal volume loss per every breath, I'm losing 460 milliliters per minute. Now let's look at the actual tidal volume delivered. So I'm just putting a D here for delivered versus the tidal volume set. And this is the equation we use to figure out actually how much tidal volume was delivered to the patient versus the tidal volume set. So in this example, we have the set tidal volume of, we're going to use 500 milliliters minus the 46 milliliters. That's the tidal volume lost. And this actually equals a delivered tidal volume of 450 milliliters. That's why in the older days of mechanical ventilation, I mean older than 10 years ago, or if you're still using older ventilators, why larger tidal volumes were more acceptable. So saying in the 12 to 15 cc range, because a lot was lost in the patient circuit. And you still might notice this from 
anesthesia providers too that they would ventilate a patient at a higher tidal volume and they come to the ICU because the anesthesia ventilator is much different than the ICU ventilator. One is the breathing system and then also they some of them do not compensate or the older ones do not compensate for the patient circuit. So you might question why are they, they're using larger tidal volumes. Now some key takeaways are all ventilators are different. So when using volume control ventilation, you might have tidal volume differences with different ventilators. Also not only the ventilators, the circuits are different. So you have different circuits, some are more compliant, some are less compliant, and you have different um, tidal volume delivery based on the circuits. Another thing to consider is with stiffer lungs or patients that have lower compliance, you're going to have greater tidal volume loss. This is just because the energy it takes to infl um, inflate the stiffer lungs or to ventilate the stiffer lungs, a lot of this energy is lost in the circuit. The ventilator is working it, uh, against the pressure of the patient lungs. And one other consideration is when the patient is more compliant, there is going to be less tidal volume lost and your tidal volumes are going to be more accurate also. Another key takeaway is you could just use pressure control ventilation. So in pressure control ventilation, I'm just targeting a tidal volume and I'm titrating my pressure control level up and down to meet this tidal volume goal. And I really do not have to worry about figuring out if um, all these equations about patient circuit compliance, if the machine compensates for the patient circuit or doesn't compensate for the patient circuit or what. And that is all. Thank you.